Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ, and this is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. You can kind of think of this channel as like um, a false prophet takedown channel. We, we, we take down the false... <laughs> We fact check them and, and take, yeah, that's what we do. Anyway, uh, today we're going to be heading over to the YouTube channel of Patricia King. And Patricia King is somebody that I have been publicly warning about and critiquing for more than a decade. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, she's been a regular feature on Fighting for the Faith in all of its iterations, including the early days of our podcast. Uh, and so that being the case, uh, this woman, there's nothing sound about her. If you know anybody that is listening to her and think that she is bringing them sound biblical doctrine or theology, send them this video. Uh, they won't like me taking her down and uh, accuse me of having a mean and harsh tone and being snarky and stuff. Uh, but but uh, the reality is, is that if they will listen to what I'm saying and just open their Bibles and consider what the scripture says compared to what this woman says, uh, then they will be set free from being deceived by her because she is somebody who, um, who also financially exploits those whom she prophesies for. And prophesy I'm using in the worst, loosest term because uh, the only types of prophecies she offers are false prophecies. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, sound in Patricia King. So uh, let me whirl up the desktop. Hang on a second here. Switching gears. And, uh, and and this, by the way, is uh, an abstract photo I took uh, recently. Uh, that's the Sydney Opera House. If you want to see it in its entirety, that's the entire composition. That's on my uh, Instagram. And again, if you would like to follow me on Instagram, my Instagram is dedicated only, legitimately only, to uh, my photography. And so, you know, that's the, the full composition. You can find me on Instagram at, at Pirate Christians, but uh, alas, that's not what we're here for. So uh, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's take a look. So the name of the video we're gonna be watching several portions of and kind of putting it all together is uh, Many Millionaires Will Be Raised Up. And if you are a Christian and you think that with a title like this, that you're going to be taught sound doctrine and that she's telling you something that's really going to happen in the near future, I, th listen, I, I, I was in the charismatic movement. I was in the latter rain movement back in the late 1980s. And all the way back then, they were talking about the imminent uh, transfer of wealth that was going to be taking place. You know, like pagans were going to be showing up on your doorstep going, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm going to write you a check for a million dollars. Listen, this this... This is not what the Bible teaches. And, uh, and her claiming that in the, in the short term, in the near term, God's going to be raising up all kinds of millionaires, it's just delusional nonsense. This is not Christian doctrine. And, uh, and this is the type of doctrine that attracts people who are financially strapped. So do you find yourself right now in financial need? Has the uh, economy, you know, with the uptick of inflation and things like this, made it difficult for you to pay your bills? Did you lose your job or something like that? Oftentimes, people who are in financial duress are the ones who are in greatest danger of being duped by false doctrines like this. So uh, let me hit the play button and uh, let's see what Patricia King has to offer. And yes, I did just speed it up a little bit and I put the closed captioning on so you can see her words. Here we go. Well, hello there and happy new year to everyone. We've already launched into the new year, almost a whole uh, week into it now. And I'm excited about everything that God's gonna do. Even now, by the way, the New Year she's talking about is the new Jewish, the Jewish New Year. Totally ignoring the fact that um, the Jewish New Year, according to the Bible, takes place in the month of Nisan. I think we're in Tishri. Hang on a second here. I uh, I found on my Apple Watch that they have a lunar uh, a lunar watch, a lunar calendar watch. Yes, we are in. Tishri. We are in the month of Tishri, and Tishri uh, is in the month of September. Tishri is not the, the, the new year 
uh, it, according to the scriptures. The scriptures make it clear. If you're going to follow a Jewish New Year, you begin the first month is Nisan, not Tishri. And, yeah, and by the way, I figured that out for, with a which watch face on my Apple Watch. It's a it's a lunar thing. But uh, anyway, uh, so so she's babbling on about it, you know, being Happy New Year. It ain't a happy new year. This the whole Jewish New Year thing that's going on right now is not biblical, and this is an innovation created by the Pharisees, and uh, they were the ones who were the last people standing after the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, and they reworked Judaism. Current modern day Orthodox Judaism is not at all biblical Judaism, not even close. And so you know, it's her claiming, oh, we're following uh, the Bible's. You know, the Bible's years and stuff like this. No, you're not. If you were, you would you would you would note that that Nisan is the first month of the year, not Tishri. So just saying. Okay, like we continue. Even though there are so many shakings going on, even as we are sitting here. See, I was gonna take a sip of my coffee and enjoy that while she was blathering on, and she's now got that crazy look on her face, terrifying me. Uh, but uh, she's there's so many shakings going on. Uh huh. Grab a prophecy bingo card. We're together in this live stream. I have some good news uh, for you in something that God's been speaking to me about for a while. Now, note, she's claiming direct revelation from God. I'm going to tell you something that God has been speaking to me for quite a while. She claims to be a prophet. She claims to get direct verbal you know, words and messages from God that she passes along, which means that she needs to be under uh, the the, uh, <clears throat> the command that we find in, um, hang on a second here, I, I, I'm going to pull this up. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> Beloved, and let me let me pull up the Greek here. Uh, I, I, we'll pull it up in gram chord. There we go. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. That's a command from God, by the way. Do not believe the, the, the pastuita. That is an imperative. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many, not some, Many false prophets have gone out into the world, and I would note that we have documented and documented and documented and documented and documented and documented that Patricia King is a false prophet. This is just going to be more documentation, more receipts that prove the point. So coming back here, so she's claiming that God's speaking to her. And over the last um, probably quarter of a year anyways, I've been getting so much feedback from believers who are saying that they're just sensing uh, shakings coming more. They're sensing shakings coming. Are they Jedi? Is there a disturbance in the force? What's going on here? Shakings, especially in the economic area, the political area. And the economic area, the political area. area. There's always shakings in the economic area and in the political area. That's the nature of both areas. Why are we talking about them as being areas? And um, it's creating fear in their heart, apprehension, not knowing where to stand, what to do with it, where to go with it. And um, fear is very dangerous. Why? Because it's the devil's faith, right? <laughs> what? Fear is the devil's faith. Um. What are you talking about? So we must be in faith in this hour and not in fear. Because now, I agree. We need to have faith in God. And I wasn't planning on this, but, you know, I think you guys are here for some Bible study. Let's throw in a little Bible, shall we? Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Okay, hang on a second here. Not sure what I did wrong. Oh, I see what I did. Okay, hang on a second here. I need to clear my search parameters first and then... By the way, I see that uh, on the comments on our on our YouTube videos, a lot of people ask the question, "What software is he using?" The name of the software is Accordance. And by the way, if you want to, if you just look in the description of each episode of Fighting for the Faith, 
we provide the links to all the software that we you know use and, and things like that. So you know, I, it's always in the description. So that's kind of standard operating procedure for a lot of YouTube channels. They actually you know talk about you know their their equipment and their software and things like that that they use. So if you want to know a link, how do you get to the Accordance website so that you can take a look at the software? It's in the description. It's it's always near the bottom, but it's always there. All right, Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six. So in Matthew chapter six, okay. You'll note that we human beings have a tendency to worry and have anxiety as it relates to, well, the things that we need in this world, money, clothing, food, drink, stuff like this, okay? So here's what Jesus says. And Jesus at this portion of the, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount is going to be giving a rebuke because people are not trusting God. So, you know, there they are, they're living their lives in complete anxiety. They are having panic attacks. They are chewing their fingernails. They are engaging in unhealthy behavior to quell their anxieties because they're in great anxiety about the future and the things that they need. And watch what Jesus' solution is to this. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Indeed it is. So look at the birds of the air. And now he's going to point us to birds. Now pay attention to what's going on here. They neither sow, you know, I've never seen any birds farming. They do not reap, nor do they gather into barns. That's correct. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I would assume so. Okay. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And I would note that anxiety has a tendency to shorten life, not make it longer, right? And why? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Who's going to clothe us? God is. And what's the problem? They don't have any faith in God. Now, here's the thing. Patricia is going to talk about a covenant of blessing. That's not one of the biblical covenants. Okay. Instead, the best way to put it is, is that God cares for his creatures because they are his creatures. Okay, uh, God created you. He cares for you. He loves you. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to bleed and to die for all of your sins. And so the idea then here is, is that we are to call out to God and to recognize that Oh, everything that we receive for the maintaining of this life, for our body, for our stomach, for our, you know, our shelter and things like this, that these all come from the hand of God. And you're going to note this, that God takes care of the needs of even non-Christians. You'll note that pagans are not out there suffering poverty at greater rates than Christians are. Or nor are yeah, and I would note that pagans may be actually experiencing, you know, wealth at greater rates than Christians are. That may be true. But you're going to note here that if you don't believe in God, God isn't sitting there going, "Well, I'm not going to feed you." Okay? That's not how this works. So, he's not Jesus isn't going to be making an appeal to a covenant of blessings, but to the fact that God loves you and cares for you, and you are his creature. He made you. He created you. He cares for you. So if you don't believe that, well, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. So indeed, he loves, for you. He, he loves you. So Christ here is pointing out that you have little faith. So therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we do? What shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But, and here's the bit, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And I would note that this then, his righteousness, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? You'll note that uh, the righteousness of God is that which is given to us by grace through faith. 
Okay, so if you like read like Romans 3, Galatians 3, and, and follow out the theme there regarding the righteousness of God that is given as a gift, Christ is saying, seek God out, seek his kingdom, seek his righteousness, his forgiveness, his mercy, all given to you by grace through faith, and all these things will be added to you, right? Right, right? So therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So note, God promises to meet the needs of all of his children, his Christians. He's not going to abandon you. Cry out to him. Trust him. He will care for you. Instead, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. That's the promise that we as Christians hang on to. Not where Patricia King is going to go, and you'll see where she's going to go here in a second. So glad I got to clear that up. Here we go. Because God has good things for us. And I want to specifically address one thing with you on this particular broadcast, and that is the area of um, wealth um, versus... The, the, the area of wealth. That's an area... Is it next to Area 51? Where, where is this area? Just poverty, okay, or, 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 or lack. And I just want to speak this into your spirit. You want to speak something into my spirit. Where is that a practice taught in Scripture? If you are a child of God living in faith in His promises, you have nothing to fear for the coming days. In fact. Well, that's true, but not for the reasons that she's going to say. It's for the reasons that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, which we just read out. God wants you to get excited about what he's going to do. God, God wants me to get excited. Yay! How much? How excited do I need to be? I mean, yay! Or do I need to be like, la ah! Kind of excited. How excited am I supposed to be here? Because people are going to come into the kingdom when they see the blessing of God on his people. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Hang on a second while the camera has to refocus after that. People are going to come into the kingdom when they see the blessing of God on his people. This touches on one of the major false doctrines of the Pentecostal, charismatic, and NAR movements. And that is that this that in order for people to become Christians, they need to see signs and wonders. And so part of the, I, the part of the logic behind the false prophecy about this idea that there's this coming wealth transfer is that um, is that that's going to be a sign to people of the, of us having God's favor, and then people will want to have that same favor on their lives, so they're going to want to become Christians too. And so um, that's not even biblical at all. And we're, we're going to debunk this, all right? We're going to debunk this by going to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. I want you to consider uh, what Christ says here in this chapter, Luke 16, uh, 19. This is the parable of the uh, rich man and Lazarus. A rich man doesn't even have a name. That's kind of an important theological point, by the way. So here's what Christ says. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. Okay. Um, how'd, that, how'd he do that if he wasn't a Christian, right? Um, <clears throat> pay attention. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Now, if you judge this according to the world standard, you'd sit there and go, uh, the rich man's blessed, Lazarus, Lazarus is cursed. But here's the thing. Lazarus has faith. Okay. Note the rich man doesn't have a name. What's his name again? What's his face? Um, yeah, the reason why he doesn't have a name is because if your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you go into eternity nameless, and the nameless ones end up in the lake of fire. Keep that in mind. Lazarus has a name. God knows his name. And although Lazarus, he suffered in this life, needed medical attention, and was poverty-stricken to the point of like begging for scraps of food and and looking longingly at uh, what you know at what uh, the rich man was eating right so so Lazarus covered with sores desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table moreover even the dogs came and licked his sores ew and then the poor man died 
And listen to this. He was carried by the angels to Abraham's side, or you can say Abraham's bosom. Uh, that, that'll work also for uh, Kolpas there. And the rich man also died, and he was buried. And in Hades, he being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Ah, how the turns have t- how the turntables, right? Uh, isn't that the Michael Scott line? How the turntables, right? So, uh, yeah, things have now completely changed. The rich man is completely poverty stricken and suffering in hell. Lazarus, who had nothing in this lifetime like legitimately nothing, now possesses everything. He has eternal life, okay? So, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, so the rich man calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and to cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. What a jerk. I mean, does he not get it yet? No, clearly he doesn't. He legitimately thinks that that, that Lazarus is still, because he was poverty stricken in his lifetime, is still his, like somebody he should look down on who's, you know, who can just bark orders to and you know, treat him like he's a slave. So Abraham said, child, remember that, in, that you, in your lifetime, you received your good things. Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And then he said, then I beg you, Father, and pay attention to this part here. I beg you, Father, to send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Okay, so consider what the request is. Make it so that Lazarus rises from the dead and he goes and visits them and says, Woo, I am Lazarus. I am back from the dead. I am here to tell you a message from your brother. You need to avoid going to hell and uh, repent and trust in God and he will forgive you of all of your iniquity, right? Um so, and of course, the thinking is, his thinking is, if Lazarus shows up, the spectacle of a man rising from the dead, that sign will be proof positive of the truth of, 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 of who God is and what's coming, that this will end up with them repenting, right? But watch what Abraham says. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. They got the Bible. Let them hear the Bible. And he said, no, 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 Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Signs and wonders do not make somebody believe. You'll note that the Pharisees, they saw Jesus raise people from the dead Okay, in fact, let me let me do this. Let me go to John chapter 11, and I might have to kind of go a little farther, but uh, let, let's see here. All right, so Jesus in John chapter 11 raises a fellow by the name of Lazarus from the dead. Not at that, not the Lazarus from the Luke's uh, parable, but an actual, a different guy by the name of Lazarus raises him from the dead. Lazarus come out. He's at, he's at his tomb and Lazarus comes out, okay? And Jesus says, unbind him, let him go. And watch the fallout from this. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered uh, the council and said, what are we to do? This man performs many signs. Well then, why aren't they believing? Because they don't believe the word of God. And you sit there and go, well, the Pharisees believe the word of God, do they? Do you even understand what a Pharisee is if you think that? Pharisees are people who completely rejected the word of God in what it says and added their own oral Torah to the word of God. Uh-huh. They, 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 they're, they're as faithful as Mormons are, okay? And Mormons are not faithful, nor are they Christians, okay? 
So this is what's going on here. The, the Pharisees are heretics. They don't listen to the word of God. They listen to the words of their oral tradition, their oral Torah, their Mishnah and their Talmuds and things. All the They bury the word of God and they make it void by all their man-made doctrines and traditions. Uh-huh. If you don't believe me, read Luke, uh, not Luke, Mark chapter 7. It'll help you out there. All right. This man performs many signs. So what? So they recognize that Jesus is performing signs. They cannot deny it. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But if one, but one of them, Caiaphas, that's the high priest, uh, who was high priest that year, said to them, "You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation should perish." He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put Jesus to death. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty awful, right? Um, yeah, and, and by the way, um, they also made plans to kill Lazarus. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Lazarus, hang on a second here. And I'm just going to take out my context, and I know it's probably like in... 12. Uh, Lazarus, born and raised from the dead, that gave a dinner. Okay, so you say, uh, uh, here he goes. John chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Listen to this. Okay, so Lazarus, ris- risen from the dead. He-, he was in the grave for four days. I mean, his body was stinketh-ing. And, uh, you know, and he's been raised. They, they can't even deny that, that Christ raised him from the dead. And watch this. So when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. So what's the point in all of this? It's actually quite simple. The charismatics claim that we've got to perform signs so that people will believe in Jesus is completely contradicted by scripture. It is not signs and wonders that convince somebody to become a Christian. In fact, that's not even how somebody becomes a Christian. And so this claim that we've got to have this great transfer of wealth so that the the pagan world will sit there and go, wow, you people are under the blessing of God. I want to be a Christian too. It's complete nonsense. Okay, Lazarus, the, the one from the original story in the in the parable in Luke 16, wanted to, you know, he, 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 he the rich man wanted to send Lazarus from the dead to warn his brothers. And Moses all know they have they have Moses and the prophets. Uh, Abraham said that they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. No, no, no. Let them hear the Bible, right? Which then comes to an important text, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Listen to what this says. The scripture says everyone, this is verse 11, who believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Flat out fact, truth. So how, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And here we go. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Consider what Paul says in this regard in Romans 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel, the good news of that Christ bled and died for your sins and was bodily raised on the third day. Uh, that, that, that's the good news, by the way. See 1 Corinthians 15, if you're not sure. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So note, the gospel is the power of God. How do people come to faith in Christ? Because they hear the good news and God, the p- gospel is the power of God into salvation. God makes Christians through the preaching of of the word. Uh Uh-huh. So uh, we've got a problem here, and that is 
that uh, Patricia King, you know, she's here talking about, oh, yeah, well, there's going to be this wealth transfer thing, and, and uh, the pagans are going to see the blessing of God on your life, and then they're, they're going to turn and all this kind of stuff. The, the, the entire foundation of that theology is rotten to the core, and is, it's, it's not even biblical. Let me back this up just a little. Listen the coming again. days. In fact, God wants you to get excited about what he's going to do because people are going to come into the kingdom when they see the blessing of God on his people. No, they're not. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's why we really need to position ourselves. Well, there's so many lies that have been taught. So you got to position yourself so that you can receive God's wealth blessings so that then people will become Christians. Hot. Um, in the body, actually, I remember being over in Israel a number of years ago talking with a, a um, Christian leader over there, and he was saying that it's a blessing for uh, Christians to be poor. The poorer Christians are, the more blessed they are. And I thought, wow, you are so misunderstanding God's covenant of blessing. The covenant of blessing is not a real thing. When you look at the biblical covenants, okay, so for instance, you have the, 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 the covenant with Noah, the Noadic covenant. You have the Mosaic covenant, which the official, uh, by the way, the Mosaic covenant is kaput. Uh, it's, it, that was a land lease agreement between God and the children of Israel, and it's not in effect anymore. It's, it's done, okay? And then the covenant that we are under as Christians, which is what? The new covenant. The new covenant, this covenant of blessing thing, it does that. That's a completely made up category that she just invented, right? And instead, the idea here is, is that under the new covenant, we are promised what? The forgiveness of all of our sins. We are promised eternal life in Jesus Christ. We are also promised that God will meet our needs. We are not, there's no covenant of blessing for Christians, which is, means that you're going to experience wealth and become millionaires and things. Remember, the name of this video is, Many Millionaires Will Be Raised Up. This is just nonsense. Um, you are so misunderstanding. Uh, the only blessing that would come to the poor is when they find out that they don't have to be poor, that God will provide all their needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But in the kingdom, faith is our currency. What? So in order to have the transference of wealth, the creation of wealth. So faith is our currency. You need to build up enough faith so that you can use that currency so that you can participate in the great wealth transfer that's coming. Listen, listen again to what she's to saying. Poor, that God will provide all their needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But in the kingdom, faith is our currency. So in order to have the transference of wealth, the creation of wealth, all of that, there needs to be faith in his promises. And that's why... I really want you to be well educated. I'll talk about that. Right, because she wants you to experience the the great wealth transfer, the thing that was promised to me back in the late 1980s when I was a charismatic. In, in a little while, because I've got a tool that will help you. It's absolutely free. I'm just passionate about seeing the body of Christ be able to stand in this hour that we're coming into. But um, first of all, I want to read a promise to you out of Deuteronomy 8.18. Okay, Deuteronomy 8.18. Now, let me help you out with the context here. Okay, so when you read the book of Deuteronomy, second law, by the way, Deuteronomy is a retelling of the Mosaic Covenant. And so you got to be careful when you're reading the book of Deuteronomy because some of the promises, in fact, I would say most, if not all of the promises in the book of Deuteronomy do not legitimately apply to Christians. Instead, these are promises promised to the children of Israel if, and this is, you're going to note, this is a part of the Mosaic Covenant. The blessings will follow if you obey. If you don't obey, well, there's curses, okay? So you got to be careful with, you know, something like Deuteronomy chapter 18. So watch, so watch, I'll show you the context here. Again, the three rules for sound biblical exegesis are context, context, and context. So Deuteronomy 8, 11, she's, she's going to quote 18 out of context. So take care lest you forget Yahweh your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. This is a, in the context then of which covenant? The Mosaic Covenant. Now, by the way, I did an entire uh, YouTube video, and it was a while back now, maybe a couple years ago, uh, and kind of sorting out the biblical covenants. And, and let me see. Let's, uh, yeah, yeah, over there. We'll, we'll put it over there. Uh, 
uh, you know, we'll put a link to our biblical covenants uh, teaching if you want to go deeper on a, on, a, on a biblical look at the different covenants of the scriptures and which ones apply to us. Mosaic covenant does not apply to Christians. We're not under the Mosaic covenant, okay? So note here, Deuteronomy 8.11 makes it clear. The context is Mosaic covenant. Uh, but take care lest you forget Yahweh your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses, and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, which is one of the promises of the Mosaic Covenant, if they obey, then your heart will be lifted up, and you forget Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and fiery, uh, terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions, and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, and that your fathers did not know that he may humble you and test you to do good in the end. So beware, lest you say in your heart, well, my power and my might, uh, the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. And if you forget Yahweh your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that Yahweh makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of Yahweh your God. So Deuteronomy 8 is not in the context of the new covenant that we're under as Christians, it's in the context of the Mosaic Covenant, which is not in effect anymore. So, yeah, Patricia King, number one, shouldn't be teaching anyone. Two, she's a false prophet. We demonstrate this for years. And, uh, and three, she's twisting this text up. She's, she's not qualified to be teaching anybody because she doesn't even know how to rightly handle a biblical text. It says, but you shall remember the Lord your God. So no matter what is happening in the world um, in these coming days, God wants you to remember him. Don't have your mind set on everything that's going on in the world and its system. Not true. God does want you to have your mind set on him. Remember him. And with that, um, Jesus said to take... Okay, now I'm going to fast forward to this next part because he's going to go on a tangent about the Lord's Supper, but that has nothing to do with this. So here's the next part. Because it is he who is giving you the power to make wealth. And so, yeah, who's the you there in Deuteronomy 18? Is it Christians? No, this is where God's making promises to the children of Israel if they obey the commands of the Mosaic Covenant. So she's totally ripped this out of context, ignoring who the you in that passage is and the circumstances under which those promises are made. And I would note here, uh, if you really want a summary of the, uh, the, the blessings and curses of the Mosaic Covenant, I couldn't find a better chapter than uh, Deuteronomy 28. Again, Mosaic Covenant. We're, as Christians are not under the Mosaic Covenant. We're under the New Covenant. But listen to, listen to what God promised. If you faithfully obey the voice of Yahweh your God, being careful to do all of his commandments that I command you today, Yahweh your God will set you high above the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of Yahweh your God. Blessed shall be you in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. Again, this isn't a grace covenant at all. This is based purely upon obedience. If you are careful to do all of his commandments and you obey then these blessings will overtake you. By the way, when you read the Old Testament, how good were the children of Israel at obeying all of God's commands? Not so good, right? And so I would note then, pay attention to the next part in Deuteronomy 28, 15, then begins the litany of the different curses for disobedience. And when you read these curses, 
it's like reading it's like reading the history of Israel in advance. These are practically prophecies because you can see every one of these curses then playing out throughout the Old Testament. And I would even note in the New Testament as well, uh, for those who are disobedient, the ones who ended up uh, murdering Christ, uh, there there were some there's, there's, there was a further uh, curse that that came about in their lifetime. Keep that in mind. So again, this is all about obedience. Mosaic covenant is not a grace covenant, it's a works covenant. We're not under the Mosaic covenant. If you, so note the curse it says, but if you will not obey the voice of Yahweh your God, or be careful to do all of his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you. So Patricia King here, citing Deuteronomy 8, totally ignoring the fact that this is a Mosaic Covenant uh, text that is promising things related to the Mosaic Covenant. Now, granted, there are principles that do apply as far as like, uh, you know, not having other gods and obeying God's commands. That's true for us under the, even in the New Covenant. We still need to obey God's commands. Uh, but uh, the, the commands that we follow, that, that we obey, are really more summarized in the Ten Commandments, not the, you know, not the feast days and, all, and you know, the, the offerings and sacrifices of the Mosaic Covenant. That's all kaput. That's all ceremonial law, and that's, that we're not under that. So, but that's a, whole other, that's a whole other episode. But she continues. Here we go. There is an ability that God is giving you to create wealth with him for his purposes and for his glory. We're not people that love money for the sake of being greedy or selfish or anything like that. No, we want to advance the kingdom. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. There is prophesied a wealth transference. And that is because God's kingdom is a stable kingdom. His economy is a stable economy. But we must learn how to live in that realm and not in the realm of worldly thinking and of a world system. Uh huh. And uh, where, where, which text are you exegeting at this point? She's not. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. This is where it just gets weird. <laughs> Buckle up, because it, we're going to have to engage in a little more of unwinding this false doctrine. There's nothing re re redeemable in this entire video of hers. The whole thing is just f rotten to the core. So uh, let's let's uh, tune into you know the, this next bit. Now, any of you that know me, you know that one of my most favored scriptures um, that God gave me as a brand new believer was Isaiah 60. I've been living in that scripture since I've been born again, but it is a prophetic word for this season, and the whole chapter is on glory. Now, one of the uh, okay. meanings of glory is wealth. So she's playing a game here. So Isaiah 60 says it's all about glory, and one of the meanings of glory is wealth. She's playing a word game. All right, and so watch what she does here, and then I'll show you how to debunk it. Okay, one of the meanings of glory is wealth. And so if you position yourself for that glory. If you position yourself for that glory, you know, wealth, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know what I mean? It says arise and shine. That means we have to do something. We have to rise in faith and let our belief shine before God and before the world that we live in. Arise and shine because your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you or the wealth of God has, has risen upon you. Now, <laughs> oh my goodness. So let me show you what she's up to here. This is so awful. It's just so deceptive. And, and she's trying to make promises for God that God is not actually making. So the text in question is Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, okay? And so here's the verse she's referencing. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory, which means wealth, okay, uh, it will, of the Lord will be, oh, has risen upon you. So this is the promise that God's going to make you wealthy, because we're going to take the word kavod, and we're going to make it mean wealth in this context. So one of the things I could say to Patricia King is... Uh, you do not know Hebrew, Patricia. You don't. Okay. Now, this is going to kind of debunk this. We're going to we're going to have to do a little bit of work. Okay. So I know Hebrew. How do I know Hebrew? I have a degree in biblical languages. Okay. That was my undergraduate degree. Now my Hebrew is a little rusty right now. I need to reapply myself to uh, 
to it. But, uh, you know, I do that from time to time. My Greek, I always keep up. My Hebrew, I wax and wane with it. So currently I'm waning and I need to wax, <laughs> wax on, wax off with my, uh, with my Hebrew. But alas, okay, so let me explain something to you. Words have definitions. We know this because we have things like dictionaries. However, the meaning of a word is dependent upon the context in which it appears. Let me give you an example. The, what does the word up mean? Uh, I'm just going to ask you right now, what does the word up mean? And you think you can kind of think, well, it means you head in that, that direction going that way, right? Well, consider dictionary.com and its definitions, plural, of the word up. It depends on the context in which the word appears, okay? So up can mean to or toward in a more elevated position, to climb up to the top of a ladder, Okay, that's one possible definition of up. Or in an erect position, to stand up. How about as a preposition? To or toward an elevated position, they went up the stairs, okay? But there's other meanings. Moving in or related to a direction that is up or is regarded as up, as in up the elevator, up the train traveling north, the, okay? The up platform of a railroad station. Now, there's more to it than that. You can, up can also mean informed or familiar or aware. She is always up on current events, okay? Up could also mean ended or finished or terminated. The game is up. Your hour is up going on or uh, 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 going on or happening taking place or occurring what's up over there having a high position or a station he is up in society okay above the earth or ground the corn is up and ready to be harvested okay uh, <laughs> you're starting to get the idea here so you go i think i get what's going on here so what up means depends on the context in which the word is used. And you cannot interchange them, right? Okay, okay, facing upward, he's resting and his face is up. Sunny side up, you get the idea. So there, you, these are not interchangeable and depending on how, where the word appears, the context is gonna determine the meaning. Same with the Hebrew word kavod. Okay, which is the word for glory. Now, what I did before our uh, before this episode, I printed out a uh, word study on the Hebrew word kavod from uh, from the Logos Bible software, which is what I use to study. I teach in accordance. I study in Logos. Okay, and so you're going to note here there are many different potential meanings for the word kavod, but wealth is one of them. So. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at, here, here's kind of a, a nice little pie chart that shows us, you know, in what proportion kavod means different things. It can mean honor or honored or honoring. It could also mean glory, like in the glory of the Lord. It can mean whole being. It could be mean being or splendor. It can also mean wealth. And here's the interesting bit is that we're able to then do a little study here that the word kavod in the Hebrew Bible occurs 200 times, okay? 200 times. And of the 200 times that it appears, 96 of the 200 times, it means a glory as in a state of glory, okay? And so, you know, and here it's got relevant passages that kind of demonstrate that particular fact. Uh, it can also mean the presence or glorious, and that occurs 47 out of 200 times. And then uh, it could be also a state of honor. That's 30 of the 200 times. It could also mean power. That's eight of the 200 times that the Hebrew word kavod appears. It could also mean wealth, and that's only five times. Now, I would note here, the translators of the uh, of the Bible, and when they put together the ESV, those who know enough Hebrew to sit on the ESV translation committee, that uh, that at no point 
did Isaiah chapter 60, rise and shine and the glory of the Lord will, will come upon you. Uh, did they see Isaiah chapter 60 as referring to wealth? Okay. Of the five times that the Hebrew word kavod is translated as wealth, they are in, this is the, in the order in which they appear. Genesis chapter 31, 2 Chronicles 32, Isaiah 10, Isaiah 61, and uh, Nahum uh, chapter 2, verse 9. That's it. So what Patricia King is basically trying to do here is take one of the potential meanings of kavod, which is wealth, and make it so that Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 is 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 supposed to be talking about wealth. That's not true. In fact, I would bet dollars to donuts that if Michael Brown saw this, that he would have to agree that Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 is not talking about wealth at all. Okay, so like Genesis 31, Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has gained all of his wealth. The Hebrew word for wealth there is kavod, which is also the word for glory. Okay, so you get the idea. It's dependent on the context. And Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of Yahweh has risen upon you. Patricia King would have you believe that kavod here means wealth. Rise and shine, your light has come, and the wealth of the Lord has risen upon you. Baloney. She doesn't know Hebrew. She is, does not how, have any concept of how the biblical languages actually work, and there is no Hebrew scholar that would back up her claim. That, oh yeah, this is saying that, uh, that, that, you know, that you need to do certain things and then God's going to make you wealthy. That's what she's saying, by the way. So let me back this up. And now that you understand what she's doing here, you can see just how duplicitous and evil this is. More proof that she's a false teacher and a false prophet. Shine before God and before the world that we live in. Arise and shine because your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you or the wealth of God has risen upon you. Now, no, kavod there does not mean wealth. I want you just to imagine that wealth arising up on the inside of you. Okay, so um, just just allow it to rise up. <laughs> just imagine that there's that wealth rising up inside me. Am I going to vomit out wealth? Seriously? Where in scripture does it say to just imagine the wealth rising up from inside of you? Allow it to grow big on the inside of you because it'll it'll produce. That's what it says in uh, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. Um, Beloved, I pray that in every respect you will prosper. That's every aspect of your... All right, 3 John. This is another text that she's taken out of context. Yeah, And you'll note, I'm, I'm going a little long here with Patricia King today because it needs to be done. So we're going to go to 3 John. This is just constantly taken out of context by false teachers. All right, so what is what are we looking at here? We're looking at a letter, okay? What is the standard procedure for writing a letter? I don't know if any of you write letters anymore, but I, when I was in high school, we had to learn how to write letters. We actually actually write letters on stationery and send them, you know, lick a stamp and put it on an envelope and send it. And there, and uh, back in the day when we, you know, before, before we sent emails, we had to actually like send letters, you know, and there was, you know, there was a business way of writing a letter. There was a, yeah, a f informal way of writing a letter. There was a formal way of, uh, the, okay. So Paul's writing a letter in the day before email. Okay. This is a standard operating procedure for how letters work. The elder to the beloved Gaius, and we know who this is from, whom I love in the truth. Watch what he says here. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. All the false teachers turn this into a promise when in fact all it is is something like this. Dear Rosalind, I pray that this, this letter finds you well and that the kids are doing well and, the, and that things are happening positively at church and at school. It's a standard greeting. It's not a promise from God. And it's just a standard way. 
in which letters are open. Read some of the other epistles and you'll see what I'm talking about. This is not a promise. This is just, well, I wish you well. I pray that this letter finds you well. Okay, beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Patricia King, she ain't walking in the truth. She is somebody who legitimately traffics in and walks in and, and, and lives in lies. Your life and be in health as your soul prospers or as your soul is positioned to align with truth. Now, God is going to be, he told me this. I'm going to, he said, I'm going to be raising up many millionaires. No, Patricia, this is complete delusional nonsense. You haven't handled the biblical text correctly yet. This is a false teaching. You are a false prophet. You are a false teacher. God is not raising up millionaires. Probably billionaires, too, because in order to advance the kingdom, and listen to this, this is what, you know. In order to advance the you know, kingdom. really stirs my heart. Because I work with anti-trafficking of uh, sex trafficking organ. Yeah, okay. So you get the idea. This, this is just nonsense. What's really going on here? What's really going on here is what the Apostle Peter warned us about. Second Peter chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, their destruction is not asleep. That text is a prophecy regarding Patricia King. That's exactly what she is. She's exploiting you with false words, and she has made herself really wealthy by trafficking in lies, not biblical truth. And the fact that I can take her down you know, at will every time she puts out a video and, and demonstrate that she is not rightly handling the biblical text, and she's flat out making stuff up, God isn't talking to her. She fails the test of 1 John 4, 1. She is not speaking by God the Holy Spirit. God isn't telling her nothing. In fact, if God is speaking to her, he's calling her to repent of her false prophecies and her false doctrines and the delusions that she's spreading in his name and the promises she's making on his behalf that he has never made and will not keep. He's not bound to do so at all. So hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. And I'd like to give a shout out to all of you who support Fighting for the Faith financially. And you've joined our crew. You make it possible for us to bring Fighting for the Faith to you into the world. And thank you for your support because we can't be here without what you're doing. And if you would like to join our crew and support us financially, follow the link down below that takes you to our page on how you can join our crew. And if you do, thank you very much for supporting us. We can't do what we're doing here without you. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Amen.